Our guest tonight says that in the realm of science, the number of active and engaged scientists describing themselves as atheists or agnostics is on the decline. In fact, a large majority of scientists, especially the younger ranks, describe themselves as theists. Whether it be advances in physics or cosmology, biology, and chemistry, or perhaps new mathematical theorems and the latest logical proofs, in the last 70 years, science has taken great strides, making it impossible to ignore the presence of an intelligent creator. Here to tell us more is the president of EWTN España, and he is also the author of the new book, New Scientific Evidence for the Existence of God. So please welcome Jose Carlos González Hurtado. Thank Bienvenido. You Thank Welcome. you very much. Muchísimas gracias. Your accent is fantastic when it comes to Spanish. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. My English is terrible, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. No, because I have a very complicated name for uh, an English-speaking person. Yeah, well, it's... You know. it's you know, one of the great things is that my neighborhood changed from Polish to Puerto Rican. Right. And it became extremely useful to learn Spanish. So, and it's been something that I've... I've loved being able to do, you know, throughout my whole life as a Jesuit. So it's uh, been very, very much a blessing to know Spanish. Okay. And it's good to have you all the way from Spain. Thank I tell you. people every week that we get people from around the world. You really are from uh, a good distance. Um, you didn't drive here from Atlanta. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's great to have you here. And one of the first things I, I'd like to establish uh, in regard to your book. Um, why do you have an interest in science? What's your connection to science that you would try to start showing some of these points? Well, there are, you know, there's an immediate answer for that and a more distant answer for mm -hmm. that. So the, um, the second one, if you want, is like, uh, you know, in my previous life, because I've been in, with EWTN for the last three years, but, you know, 28 years I've been out of my country, of Spain, and mm -hmm. I was a uh, I was uh, the CEO of a technology company and uh, working for business. So at one point when I was living in Ukraine, of all places, I started doing um, lectures on God and science. Uh, then I moved to Germany and, uh, you know, they continue asking me to do these lectures. Then I moved to France and the same thing. And, and one of these lectures appeared in YouTube and it got a lot of um, viewership. So an editor asked me to uh, to write a book about the things that I was, you know, I was teaching. So that is, the, if you want, the, the most long yes. answer. But the immediate one is actually the realization that one of the reasons why young people leave the uh, religious practice, actually the main reason, believe it or not, is not, you know, I don't like the Pope, or I don't like my priest, or I don't like those, this uh, dogma, is I think that science and God are uh, confronted. And mm -hmm. this is what millennials and generations said they believe. And that is the main reason. Actually, there's a, a research from the, in the States, a pure research, says 82% of people that leave their religious practice is because they think that science is confronted with God. And it's amazing, mm -hmm. Father Mitch, because it is it's not only a myth, it's, it's like uh, exactly the opposite. Well, I would say there are two components to that. First, I commend those young people because what they want is truth. They have an instinct to care about what is true, no matter where it leads them. And, you know, whether they go into science in a serious way or history, they still want the faith to be true and science to be true and to see the unity of truth exactly and they're going to be committed to it. Would exactly that be? That. Exactly. That. Actually, I, in that same research, they say like 63 percent, they're asking for proofs 
So you, you want me to believe in that? Give me a proof. Exactly. And the, uh, and that is, you know, and that and the point is, it looks, Father Mitch, that providence has decided in this age to give us more um, scientific proofs than ever before, because exactly. science always led to God. So it's like the myth of science is against God is is, is really a myth, and it's an interested myth actually. Uh, but and, and, but here's part of the issue, that was going to be my second point. You have myth makers among some of the scientists, uh, Richard Dawkins and uh, Christopher Hitchens, who's passed away now, and uh, 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 Bennett. These were professional atheists who did not use proof all that well, as much as they used ridicule of people who had religious faith. And they oftentimes would not only ridicule people of faith, uh, but they themselves at times became so committed to a theory that was disproven, such mm. for some some the scientists physicists who did not like the Big Bang theory because it proved that the universe had a beginning and they wanted the universe to be eternal so they didn't accept it so their own creation of mythology of science versus religion is was another part of the problem that attracted a lot of people who did not want to be seen as fools I tell you one thing, the, uh, the, the ones that you have mentioned, Richard Dawkins, Hitchens, Sam Harris, Christopher Bennett, uh, Michel Onfray in, mm -hmm. in France, um, they have done incredible damage. Now, the, it's exactly as you said. They have an ideology and they were fostering the ideology without regards of facts, right. number one. Number two, thing to, to be said, they are not scientists. I'm sorry. You know, Christopher Bennett was a journalist, or is a journalist. Uh, no, sorry, Hitchens was a journalist. Bennett yes. is, is a philosopher. Sam Harris is a philosopher. Uh, Michel Onfray is a teacher in philosophy in a, in a school. Yes, uh, Dawkins studied zoology, but really never practiced, if you want. So it's funny because they speak for the science, but they are not scientists, number one. Number two is, Something that is an important thing that I, I remark in the book and in every lecture that I do is like, hey, most of the scientists believe in God, exactly as you said that you're the beginner. And more and more, and so it, the only, the only um, slice of scientists that consider themselves atheists in majority are the scientists that are more than 70 years old in states and, uh, and they've never practiced science. The truth is that they, among the Nobel Prizes in the last 100 years, and this is a study I, in, I include in the book, Nobel Prizes in the last 100 years, 95% of the Nobel Prizes in uh, physics, chemistry, or, uh, or medicine, they are theists or they're religious people. I, I think that's something to keep in mind, because we had a member of a team who that, that won the Nobel Prize a few years ago, uh, Dr. Anthony Rizzi, and uh, he is not only just believes that there is some abstract God, but he believes in in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He believes in the redemption. He's and a this is complete the Catholic. And the majority of them are exactly. like that. Now, it's interesting because the uh, the um, Nobel Prize is in literature. So the guys that if you want to invent things, thirty-five percent are atheists. So I always say, like, if you are a scientist, you believe in God. If you are not believing in God, usually you are from literature, because it's, it's science brings you to God. And that I, I would something that's worth pointing out to our viewers, especially in the uh, literature professorships of the last uh, generation. There's a strong influence influence from Jacques Derrida, who was a philosopher. And he especially influenced the people in the literature departments 
to believe that words mean whatever you want them to mean. Mm -hmm. uh, he would go around <laughs> giving lectures on this, telling mostly dirty jokes, and then, <laughs> you know, and, and convince English uh, professors of this, mean who are not scientists, um, and instead of, they're neither teaching literature anymore, nor are, and certainly not good literature in many places, but they are not scientists, and yet they'll critique the Christian believers on the basis of Derrida's uh, deconstruction philosophy. This is a philosophy that is not taken off in many other places except literature. Whereas the scientists who are dealing with the facts of physics and chemistry and biology are the ones who are believing God. They're in contact with reality instead of myth-making. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's exactly right again. Uh, the, uh, you, one could argue that there is like a plan of taking people out of God and then this myth has been built on, on that plan, if you want. So that is one of the myths that I'm trying to mm -hmm. destroy in the book, which is, hey, you know what, you know, the more science that you have, the more God you have. So Anton Seilinger, who is the Nobel Prize of Physics 2022, I think is the last one, you know, he actually converted and said, hey, you know, the amazing things that I see in nature has, uh, and he finishes a fantastic sentence, I have decided to believe in God. Because this is one thing that I usually tell my, uh, you know, Catholic friends and, and the atheistic friends is, the, this belief usually is rooted in uh, will. It's not an issue of understanding. And this is what St. Thomas used to say. He said, listen, to believe, you need to have will, you have to have understanding and the grace of God. But usually the one that is missing is will. I don't want to believe. I don't right. want to believe. So, you know, the other thing that is amazing for the Mitch is like since this, uh, this book was ap appeared a couple, uh, several months ago in Spain. You know, it, to my surprise, it has been selling incredibly well. You know, we are putting the fifth edition now. But the most amazing thing is the, the letters that I receive from people, youngsters mostly, uh, that say, hey, you know what, uh, I can no longer be uh, an atheist. Mm -hmm. You know, the, uh, the things that you're explaining in your book or in the podcast that I go or in the interviews like mm -hmm. this, um, I've never heard. And, you know, I check them because exactly as you said, they check, they want to have the truth. Yes. And they check. So the book has seven, more than 700 footnotes so that everybody can check whether what I'm saying is true or not. And I have checked them, and it's true, and I can no longer continue being an atheist. Because atheism, in most cases, is an ideology, it's a, it's a negative religion. So they believe the same, but without, based on reality. There, there was a very well-known atheist physicist named Flew, I believe. He was not a physicist, he was a literature, he was the, he was the, uh, a Bertrand Russell follower, if you want. Oh, to. okay, as a disciple Bertrand yeah, Russell. Yeah. And as, as an example of he what converted. you're saying, he came to believe in God after having argued in favor of atheism for decades. Absolutely. And Dawkins and his hmm. colleagues in the atheist business said, well, he's become senile. The only way that they can accept that he uh, became a believer is that he had to lose his mind because he doesn't agree with them. It reminds me of the way communism it's was. Like, yeah. That the communists said, it's insane to believe in God. You believe in God, the, therefore we have to put you in an insane asylum. Exactly, exactly that. It's, you know, when I was writing the book, I, um, and when I was doing the research, I had like the good guys and the bad guys. Mm -hmm. Okay, so all of a sudden they were like, you know, people that were shining like, wow, this guy is uh, intellectually honest. And one of them is Anthony Flew. Mm -hmm. Anthony Flew is actor, as you said. So he was the uh, the icon of atheism during the 20th century. Mm -hmm. He was like for 50 years. Which he lived through most of it. He oh, was yeah, yeah, yeah. 90 he, when he died, 90 he something? Was, yeah, he died in nine, 2004, 2007, or between mm -hmm. that. And he was like, yeah, uh, 90 something. But, but he was, if you were an atheist in the 20th century, you would be reading Anthony Flew's 
books. Mm -hmm. Now, it comes 2004, and it's important because this actually demonstrates the point of the book, and uh, which is the, the end of the uh, project, the genome, the human genome project. Yes. And he sees the results. And he understands also the, uh, the consequence of the cosmology. And he says, you know, I've seen the, uh, the discoveries of science in the what is immense and what is the uh, limit, I mean, very, very small. And I can no longer continue believing that there is no an intelligence behind. I wish I could, which is amazing because he's saying, listen, it's like, I, I'm not converting into theism just by feelings or because of warmth. Mm -hmm. It's no, 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 no. Listen, I am leaving behind 50 years of my life just to uh, follow the truth wherever it leads me. It's a sentence, I follow the truth wherever it leads me. But exactly as you said, the, the uh, reaction of Mr. Dawkins, it actually is, uh, is showing what kind of, I'm sorry to say, individual the guy is, you know, because he was his, uh, Anthony Flew was his hero up until that moment. And in that very moment, he started trashing him publicly. They never confront, he never confronted him personally. Even Anthony Flew asked him, and he said, hey, you know what? You never wrote me a letter. I, I say this, all this in the book, by the way. You, I've been saying this, and you are talking to the public against me without even talking to me. You're telling me, you're telling me that I'm senile, and you, you, we have never talked. Um, and this is actually demonstrates that Mr. Dawkins, he had, a, again, a, a priori, and he wanted just to force his ideology, even trashing what, who was his hero before. Yeah. Uh, really is a, is a sad story for, a sad story for Mr. Dawkins, actually, because he, you know, the picture that you take out of this story is, is really bad for, for that guy. Yeah, and th there were, uh, this is one of the points um, that, uh, well, I'll, I'll mention another book about some developments in the same field that's going on, um, but one of the issues that's also true is atheism is a relatively superficial ideology that has nothing to hold itself together. Too many of the atheists cannot accept the truth when they see evidence of God, and as a result, they have to focus on ideology the way communists do. And just like the Communist Party or the Nazi Party, any other socialist totalitarian party, they have to, they start turning on themselves and purging, mm -hmm. you know, the people that they dislike. And it, you know, the, the infighting among the atheist movement where their ideology is justice, but without God, there's no mercy. And so they turn on each other and I'm more woke than you are. You aren't woke enough and they exclude each other. And it, it just reminded, reminded me of the history of party purges in, uh, among Nazis and communists, there, who also, by the way, happen to be atheists. Exactly. It's, you know, there are a couple of instances that I also mentioned in the book on that one. Number one, when the, uh, another proof that the existence of God, I mean, we mentioned very many times the Big Bang, and, and I will mention it in a second. The second one is, the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics predicts that the universe will have a, a death, I mean, what is a thermical death, mm -hmm. okay? Now, this was first time written by a Catholic uh, Austrian called Mr. Boltzmann. Now, in 1869, and I put a letter here from one atheist to another atheist, and it's interesting because this actually shows how they think. This guy is saying, th this guy, I, I will reveal to you, is Mr. Engels writing to Mr. Marx in 1869 <laughs> saying, hey, Carl, have you read about this theory? It is impossible to be true. Because if the theory was true, meaning the second law of thermodynamics, and the universe will have a, an end, that will immediately mean that God exists, and that cannot be true. Hence, 
the second law of thermodynamics is not true. Yes. And that is the rational. It's like, hey, you know what? Because God cannot exist. Anything that drives me to the existence of God is not true. And they deny the second law of thermodynamics yep. by doing this. The second example, um, again, many people know that this, the Big Bang Theory was first developed by a Catholic priest, uh, Father Lemaitre, in the French. Yeah, uh, Georges priest, Lemaitre. Georges Lemaitre. In, 18, in 1944, it's the first time that he wrote it. And, uh, you know, it was reconfirmed in 1966, and it has been reconfirmed every, every since until 2012 with the border billing and Guth uh, theorem. But people, uh, most of the people, or some people do not know that there's another scientist called Mr. Friedman who developed the same theory at the same time and in parallel. And he was a, he was a Russian guy. Uh, he, was the, uh, he was the head of, uh, um, you know, Cosmology Institute in St. Petersburg, I mean Leningrad at that time, mm -hmm. and um, and they kill him, and they kill him because of that. So he wrote, you know, the universe has to have a beginning. I have discovered because of this and this and this that there is something that what we call now Big Bang. Um, him and all his entourage, all the people that was working with him, were killed by the Soviets. Actually. It's interesting because, you know, for whatever strange reason, they have this tendency of poisoning the people. They kill him, they poison him in his wedding trip, him and his wife in his wedding trip. And they kill all of them because another letter that I put, the, Soviet, the Soviets thought that the Big Bang was the biggest challenge to the materialistic science. Yep. Now, the guy that, there was one guy that, that escaped, Mr. Gamov, that came here to the States. And he was one of the uh, of the supporters of the Big Bang at that time. But this is interesting because it got exactly as you said, you know, the uh, communists and the Nazis, um, everything that was against their atheistic ideology was not existent and has to be destroyed. And they killed many of the of the most brilliant scientists in the Soviet Union just because they discovered what we know now that is true, which is like the beginning of the universe, that the universe had a beginning. This, by the way, is an extremely important point for our own times, because we saw, especially during the COVID uh, pandemic, that anyone who came up with alternate theories of where COVID came from, than what the government allowed, or alternate methods of treating the COVID other than what the government promoted and paid for were canceled, not only by the government, but at the government's insistence, they were canceled on the social media. And there, this indicates that there were forces within the government that were just as totalitarian, almost, they, they don't know that they killed anybody, but they, but they certainly would try to kill ideas on the social media. Uh, and and they, can, they cannot allow science to keep developing. That's, that's the nature of science. Science is always learning more. Yeah, to, to say that, well, we figured it all out, and this is true, you can't have any other theories, that's no longer scientific. Yeah, this is, a, again, um, it happens all the time, by the way, uh, when politicians or, or, or scientists, they, uh, they have an ideology that is overruling their scientific, um, let's say, uh, aim, then exactly as you said, they, uh, they try to censor anything that is not the official way of, or, or what they, at that point, is official. It has happened every time, always. But I would say that in the 20th century and the 21st century, it's even, even more. Um, and exactly as you say, it happened with the Big Bang. and. And uh, they tried to even, you know, I mentioned some some scientists that they knew that the Big Bang was true. But they tried to censor, even knowing 
that it was true, because he was against the uh, the uh, their idea of the universe had to be uh, eternal. Now remember, there's, uh, and this is always uh, what I what I say in the. Who, who was it that had done that? It was there an was Englishman. There was one guy called Mach. You know, oh. when the, the guy that we call, you know, when we say Mach 1, Mach 2, mm -hmm. when the car, when the planes but, go. Yes. So that scientist gives the name to this. He was an atheist and he was one of them. Um, uh, and he, but, but there are several other. There's a, the president of the, of the magazine Nature, I don't remember his name now. He was also trying to, to uh, put down every evidence that the Big Bang was true because you know, he was an atheist, he was a materialist, and he was... And, and remember, there's only two alternatives. I always say this to my, my, um, my disbeliever, unbeliever of friends. There are only two alternatives. Either the universe is eternal, the universe is, has a beginning. Now, if the universe is eternal, that is not probably a problem for an atheist, because he can say, well, mat you know, mat matter is eternal. Right, and but then it can be a materialist. Exactly. Now, it's not a problem. It's also important. It's not a problem for a Christian. If the universe was eternal, it wouldn't mm -hmm. be a problem for a Christian either. But if the universe has a beginning, that represents a huge problem for an atheist. Because if you have a beginning, there's something that has to happen before the beginning. And remember that the Big Bang is not only saying that all the matter was created at one point in time, you know, 13.7 billion years ago. It was that the space was created there, and the time was created there. And that is more difficult to understand. So there was no time and no space before the Big Bang. So this actually necessarily pushes you to the concept of one being that is not material, because all the matter appeared at that point, that is not, it's not within space, because the space appeared there, and is not temporal. He has no time. And that remembers, reminds us very much to our God. Now, I was you know, going to ask you along that line. When they say there was a big bang, they are talking about an explosion. Yes. What was it that exploded? What was the material that exploded? It was all the, all the matter in the universe. Mm -hmm. It was at that time in uh, less than, uh, than a pin, than the size of a pin. And it's, at, at that time, it's like the laws of physics do, do not um, abide, if you want. They not work, okay? It's called the singularity, that moment. And then you have the big expansion. And in one billionth of a billionth of second, billion times this space was created. And ever since, this space is expanding. And the universe is expanding. Now, they many times ask me, so what is outside the universe? Because it's like a big cone, if you imagine. It's a big cone that is expanding. Mm -hmm. OK, so the universe has borders. Exactly. The universe has borders. The universe is not eternal, and the universe has uh, limits. It has a limits. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know that it has 10 times 53 kilograms of mass. Mm -hmm. So it has limits. It, has, it is what it is. So what is outside? You know, that is where science stops. Science stops in that world. Science explains what is inside. What is outside is more for theologians, okay? But what we know is that the space, everything that the space is, is that within the universe. Now, the important thing is like, if that happened, and we know for sure that it happened, because you know, I, and many times I'm, you know, I still remember, say, hear people saying, oh, the Big Bang theory is a theory. Well, it is, Pretty proven. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's proven, the, you know, theoretically. Uh, as I said, there's a theorem, 2014. It's called Borde Billing Kinnigut that demonstrates theoretically that this happened, and it's demonstrated even by, by some, you know, uh, checks, if you want, with satellites. Now, if this demonstra is, demonstrates that this what we call God, and at the beginning of the book, I don't call him God because I realize, Father Mitch, that for many atheists. The word God makes them believe on a guy with a beard yeah. and, uh, you know, with a white robe. Say, okay, forget it's what it. what the politically correct might say, it triggers them. Yes, <laughs> yes. So I call, them, I call it a super intelligence. Call it a super intelligence, a super intelligence. And it's easier for young people to say, okay, yeah, super intelligence, yes, and not God. It's like, wait a second, what is God? It's, if not a, you know, excuse me, super intelligence. So, Super intelligence that created this, again, it was not material, was not temporal, and it didn't have space. But on top, 
it took care of the creation. So the other thing that, demonstra that science demonstrates is not the deism. The difference between deism, as you know, and theism is that the deism is like God exists, but he doesn't Forgot care about, about exactly. he's uninvolved in yes. uh, creation. It's, it's a number of the early founders, not all, but a few of the early founders of the United States were deists okay. because this was uh, uh, something they learned from Scottish philosophers. Oh. Uh, the, the, the Scottish philosophers were teaching that at the time and they had a big influence at uh, the, the one college in Virginia. So okay. that had an effect. But science demonstrates that there is a God that actually takes care of the creation. Mm -hmm. Because ever since, again, the universe was created 13.7 billion years ago, but five billion years ago was the solar system, and then 4.8 was the, the Earth. And, and we know that in every single moment, things happened so that you and me, we are here. And this is the amazing thing. The amazing thing that is like, you know, the more that you go into science, you realize that there's somebody that has been meddling with the laws of physics and with the, so that we are here. And he wanted us here. Let's take a break right there. We have to take a little stop. Um, we, but we're going to come back and start with that, okay? All right. Um, again, I want to encourage you to check out EWTN España. Uh, just go to EWTN.com. Yes, because we really are 24-7 in Spanish in España, so as well as the rest of the world. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes, so please stay with us. discussing a really wonderful book. I think a lot of you parents and grandparents who tell me on a regular basis, my child has left the church, they don't believe in God anymore, etc. This would be a great book for y'all. It's called New Scientific Evidence for the Existence of God. It's written by our guest, Jose Carlos Gonzalez Hurtado. You can get it at EWTNRC.com and just look up item 83832. 83832 at EWTNRC.com or just look up the title New Scientific Evidence for the Existence of God. And this is something that um, you're I would recommend y'all read and also read with your sons and daughters who, or, or other relatives who have lost the faith and challenge them and say, you give me something by an atheist and I'll give you this. We'll read it and let's take a look at the discussion. That would be worth doing. And one of the reasons it's worth doing is because we have the evidence here. Now, we've been discussing the importance of physics and the Big Bang. Uh, and uh, let's continue on with a discussion of why science does indicate that God exists. Well, there's not only, um, in the book, we, I'm not talking only cosmology and physics. Yes. Um, talk mathematics. Which is, you know, I have to say that this is written for everybody. So I mean, I sometimes I, I get lectures, you know, and old women say, "Hey, you know what? This is this written. Am I going to understand it? I'm not a scientist." Uh, no, I have to say that this has been written. I mean, my mother is 92 years old. She wrote me and said, "Hey, Jose Carlos, I understand it. I, I, uh, I can read it." Yeah. And my son uh, Diego is one of my sons. I have 
seven of them, but uh, Diego is um, 11 years old and he also understood it. So I think I have to say that this is for everybody. But you know, you have cosmology, physics, mathematics, biology, and chemistry. And this, as I said at the beginning, it is, is the new developments, is the things that have happened in the last decades. And as I was saying, it looks like the Providence has given us more, more uh, materials for, uh, to be convert, to convert people that are getting away from the church. You know, one thing, I, I was reflecting on this one, Father Mitch, the other day. Um, in the 13th century, uh, we had St. Thomas, you know, St. Anselm, and, and they were writing the demonstrations of the existence of God from a philosophical point of view. You know, right. you have the five ways. Uh, you have the uh, ontological argument of St. Anselm. I have to say that I'm convinced by each, just a single one of the five ways will convince anyone that a superior being exists. Now, the problem that I have realized, and, and I was for some time also a teacher of philosopher, I mean, a professor of philosopher in the university, mm -hmm. philosophy of law, of all things, and uh, is that, you know, the, the young people, they don't have the patience to learn metaphysics. They don't have the, uh, the time, and they don't have the knowledge. So it is very difficult to convince them through one of the five ways, or the five ways of St. Thomas, because they will not understand. Now, my point is, science is today providing us the new five ways. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like cosmology is telling us, look, the universe had a beginning. The biology, the genome, the, the, the DNA on, in, in our bodies is a language. You know, Francis Collins, was the head of yes. you know the human genome he began uh, you know when he started the project in 1990 he was an atheist at the beginning at the middle of the project i mean the project finished in 2004 at the, beginning, at the middle of the project he became a theist uh, then at the end of the project he's a christian and now he he's in the, the my understanding is like he works also with the pope for in the you know mm -hmm. scientific council of the pope mm -hmm. and uh, and he wrote this book, which is um, Language of God. And he says, listen, what you can find in the DNA is a language. And behind any language, there's an intelligence. Yeah, and there has to be a speaker for a to language to exist. There's no language, no matter whether you're talking IT language or human language or whatever language, that doesn't have an intelligence behind. And, you know, I make the calculations, Father Mates, in, in the book. And it's like, you know what, uh, the DNA, we have, uh, I don't know how to say in English, basis pairs, pair, you know, for, for the DNA to work, you have to have, but um, it's the basis in Espanol, it's like, uh, it's, it's, so you have adenine, timine, Cytosine. Yeah, so there the, are four, the four exactly, basic components exactly. that are the basis and that these uh, and they are have given to be, letters exactly. and they have to interact. Exactly. Now we have 1.365 million pairs of bases in our, in our DNA. To be able to, that these assembled on a, um, you know, by a casual, so it's like uh, statistically, we would have to have one chance in four times one, three, six, five million. So in other words, it is impossible that this has been assembled by coincidence. Even the numbers in the human genome demonstrate that it's impossible that it has been assembled by coincidence. Which is oftentimes the go-to explanation of atheists. They'll say, oh, it just was a coincidence that this happened to work out. But the numbers demonstrate the opposite, and that is what I'm trying to demonstrate in the book. Yes. It's like the numbers, uh, when they say, hey, you know, the universe is, is super big and we have, I don't know, thousands of, of planets, so it's just, you know, it so happens that we have, uh, we have, you know, life on Earth. It was a coincidence, it's a happy coincidence. I do the, the numbers in the book. I mean, actually, I quote, for example, Roger Penrose with Nobel Prize in 2020. And he calculated what are the chances that we have a universe with the low entropy, 
the low entropy, which is again referring to the second law of thermodynamics. That the entropy means that everything is going to dissipate and fall apart. The entropy is the, the uh, measure of uh, the order in a system. Mm -hmm. So the, you have a low entropy, you have a big order. And it was, uh, as we were discussing uh, off camera, it is uh, very difficult to believe that after a big bang we had such a low entropy. Meaning like we have order after this huge explosion is very, very uh, uh, unusual. It's, it's, uh, almost Einstein said that this wouldn't, we should not expect the order that we have. But an atheist could say, well, we were lucky. Okay, so we were lucky. So yes, we could not expect, but you know what? Uh, sometimes we're lucky. So Roger Penrose calculates what are the chances of having a universe like we have with the low entropy that we have among the all the possible universes, okay? And I'm, I'm not gonna explain it here long, but it's basically you have one chance in 10 times 10, and all this number times 123, not times, to D, 123. And that number is so big. So in other words, it's like if, if you were getting the, uh, the lottery, if you were winning the lottery, I tell that to everybody, if you win the lottery today, and I give you a, another ticket of lottery, and you win it tomorrow, and I give you another lottery, and you win it the day after tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow, what would you think? You would think. I'm from Chicago, I know <laughs> what I would think, <laughs> yeah. that this is a rigged system. Exactly, and this is what is happening to us. Somebody has given us every day, Father Mitch, uh, a lottery ticket that has uh, a, a win every day. And by the way, when I say this, always in, uh, in the lectures, I stop for a second and say, uh, and I took a moment to say thank you to God. Because the reason why we are here is because, and this sometimes we forget, is because he wants. Should he not want in every second I would not be able to speak the next sentence. Yes. I, I had my sophomore religion teacher right in that chair. I interviewed him. He was the Archbishop of uh, James Kelleher. Uh, Archbishop James Kelleher taught me sophomore religion. He said, if God stopped thinking about you for even a tiniest fraction of a sentence, you would cease to exist without even a puff of smoke. That's exactly it. And we, we have to remember that, because again, it's not like uh, my, uh, my daughter Clara throws the ball and forgets about the ball, and where is the ball? And the ball is Jose Carlos. No, God is looking at the ball in every turn that the ball does, and the ball is Jose Carlos. And if I can continue speaking, it's because he wants, deliberately wants. And what, that is what, Father Mitch, science shows. This, the uh, uh, amazing reality, that you, like you said, that the possibility that this was a coincidence that we won a billion dollar lottery every day for the rest of our lives would be statistically impossible. Somebody would have to be putting in the fix. Um, and I have, I remember an argument C.S. Lewis had made in his wonderful book, Miracles, hmm. a preliminary report. And in that book he said, if everything happens by chance, it's just by coincidence. Then that necessarily means that the theory that everything happens by coincidence must be a mere coincidence. Mm -hmm. This is a matter of chance. Now, I've said this to atheists when they give me their theory of coincidence. Say, well, you know, that's an interesting theory, but that means necessarily your theory is coincidental and just happened by chance. Yeah. And what, the way you were raised, and maybe what you ate for breakfast, I don't know. I said, no, no, 
no, this is true. I said, oh, see, your re emotional reaction to this is another coincidence. No, but wait a minute, I thought this through. I said, I know, and you th that's a coincidence that you think you thought it through, but you know, apparently it's just one more coincidence like your life. And, and, and you're right, but on top is like, science is telling you, no, it's not a coincidence. So exactly. one after the other, he's <laughs> like, hey, you know what? Sorry. I'm going to go with science. Yeah, it's like cosmological, uh, uh, so the constant, the cosmological constant, the uh, fine tuning of the cosmological constant. And if the cosmo what do you mean by cosmological constant? Is, is what makes, uh, so uh, the universe is expanding. So the, without the cosmological constant, the, uni the universe would not be expanding. Now this is fine tuned at 120 uh, decimals. So it's 0, 0,000, 0, 0, 0, 120 times, and then 138. Now, should that not be like that, the universe would have collapsed yes. after the Big Bang, and we would not be here. And, and, and there are 30 of these cosmological constants. There are 200 in the book. I, I, oh, two, I, you got I, 200. 200. See, I've read older books. Yeah. I'm an old guy. It's 200. And, and you know what? Nobody in physics believes that the cosmological constant has been there by coincidence. Actually, even, uh, you know, Fred Hoyle said, Fred Hoyle, who was the atheist at the beginning that was against the Big Bang, yes. and he became, at the end, a theist, he said, so listen, Nobody that works on physics can believe that the uh, that physics has not been created so that we are here. Mm -hmm. And you know another another uh, famous physicist uh, called Turok. He used to say, you know, the biggest miracle is the laws, mm -hmm. the laws of physics, because they are there. We observe them, but should they not be like that? the universe will not be here. And there is no reason why they're like that. I always say, so listen, um, the speed of light, we all know 300,000 kilometers per hour. Well, why? Uh, why is it a constant? There's no reason to be a constant. There's no necessary reason. Now, if it's not a constant, we would not be here. And, and in fact, if the speed of light were either five kilometers per second faster, or slower. Nothing would escape. Nothing could exist. You Nothing couldn't would. even have gravity. No. Unless the speed of light were that constant. And it has to be precisely that. It's not like, oh, let's let's give it a little gas. We'll put a little nitro into yeah. No. I know. <laughs> and, 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 all, and all this works together on top. It's That's like, the other they're, they're all perfectly coordinated with each other. If any one of the two hundred constants, I was just Happy with thirty, <laughs> but now, <laughs> but with two hundred constants, if any one of them constants are lost, okay. yeah, these yeah. are lost. Yeah. But uh, this is one of the points too, that shows science comes from Christianity, hmm. because the very notion that you are looking for a law of physics means that you understand that there is a law giver. That was the first assumption of the earliest scientists, like Sir Isaac Newton, who was a Christian uh, yeah. a minister. I, I and he, was a, he was a theologian, as a matter exactly. of fact. Exactly. And, you know, and, and Galileo didn't become an atheist, did he? No, he, he was, stayed a Catholic. Yeah, and I use, uh, you know, I, sometimes I, I make this joke, like, listen, how many people think that I, I, Galileo shouldn't have been burnt? And, and people stand up, like, <laughs> listen, sorry, Galileo was never burnt. I mean, like, no. this is one of the myths that has been, he was within the church, and he was a friend of the, of, uh, of the uh, cardinal and living fantastically in the palace in the Vatican all his life during this three months that he was confined. And his way. colleagues, were the Jesuits at, who ran the Pope's astronomical observatory mm -hmm. and had corrected the calendar just before he, you know, he came around based on astronomy and improving it. I mean, the, the, the Pope that uh, you know, got him in so much trouble was himself a scientist. Yeah. 
The real issue was that the Pope said, look, this is a theory. You haven't proven it yet. Don't say that it's true until you have proof. Proven it. Yeah. And Galileo, I, I don't want to say it's just because he's an Italian, but he <laughs> could be pretty emotional about his theories. Yeah. When the theory was proven after the, you know, Venus crossed over the, the equator of the sun in the 1700s, the church said, oh, now it makes me, now you got proof. But I want to go back to one thing that you said at the beginning, and it's also another important thing to, to pass along. It's like, listen, science is rooted in Christianity. And, uh, you know, the first scientists were um, Catholic priests. Yes. Universities were created by uh, Catholic clergymen. Uh, genetics was started by a Catholic priest. The, uh, genetics was an Augustinian. Yes, Mendel. an Augustinian. Uh, the, you know, uh, and, uh, by the way, the book is filled with all of them. It's, like, it's full of, of people that are uh, you, you know, Catholic priests or clergymen uh, that founded science. And this is an important thing with the advantage of having lived also in, in some countries that are not Christian, Muslim countries. One of the things that happened with our science is that God has the principle of not contradiction. And that, that is supporting the faith. That supports the science. What do I mean? It's like, you know, if the reality has to be in one way, and you can observe reality, and you can um, make conclusions of reality, it's because God has the no contradiction principle, meaning things will happen. You know, the, you know my pen will fall all the time. Mm -hmm. Because God will not contradict Himself, and this is this is very Christian. That is our Christian God, the God that is not contradicting Himself, the God that is always good and is supporting reality and is supporting you know reason. That is a Christian God, and I have to say that that God is not necessarily other religions God. You know, uh, I, we in the Jewish people, we, yes. which, which also explains why there are so many wonderful Jewish uh, scientists, we hold that same principle that originally comes from Genesis. And instead of fighting about saying, well, how could the world be only 5,000 years old? We have to recognize that in Genesis, the places where science began, Babylon, where they st were doing fairly interesting astronomy. Same in Egypt, and also mathematics. Science was flourishing in Greece, not so much in Rome, but in Greece. And all of that science kind of collapsed because they were pagans who believed that the forces of nature were gods. Mm -hmm. They worshiped the moon and the sun, the storm, etc., And they couldn't study it with neutrality. We believe God created everything. It's just a creature this and one. not a deity. And therefore, we can study it, and God will give us a study. The, the, uh, the God that we are talking is exactly, as you said, is the Judeo-Christian God. Yes. Uh, now, Interestingly, the book, I finished the book uh, with, um, with a, okay, and now what? Because the book is, is a science book. You want me yeah. to? Well, we, we're running out of time. I'm, I'm for you. This is a great conversation. We okay. have just a little bit of time left. Okay. And I, I just want to be able to make sure you're pointing to the book. I want the folks to point to it. Uh, it's called The New Scientific Evidence for the Existence of God. It's by our guest, Jose Carlos Gonzalez Hurtado. It is item number 83832, 83832. It's available at EWTNRC.com. And you can also find out more about his work at, uh, for, at Espana, uh, EWTN Espana, EWTN.es. I'm so sorry that we're okay, out of time. Super. But I really want to thank you and thank all of you. May God bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
we can bring you this kind of a fun discussion. I wish we had more time, but we can do this and all the other shows that we do, plus have EWTN around the world, because you keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill. Our Lord inspired that generosity. Thank you for helping us continue this service. God bless you.